I believe that God has great things in store for us. If you believe that, say amen this morning. Amen. Amen. I want to read you a passage of scripture this morning. It's out of John chapter 4. And I'm going to read John chapter 4, verses 35 through 38. John chapter 4, verses 35 through 38. Do not say four months and then the harvest. I tell you, open up your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus says one sowing and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap a harvest that you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. You know, this morning, I want you to kind of have an understanding a little bit about this passage of Scripture right here in John chapter 4. What has just happened a little bit earlier in John chapter 4 is uh, Jesus and his disciples, uh, they're getting ready to go through Samaria. In John chapter 4 and verse 4, it says this, now, he had to go through Samaria. When you first read that passage of Scripture, you think that's not really a big deal. He had to go through Samaria to get where he was going. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus did not have to go through Samaria. As a matter of fact, I have a little bit of understanding the context right here. Most Jews went around Samaria. They didn't want to be anywhere near Samaritans. As a matter of fact, to a Jew, Samaritans were the lowest of the low. They were part Gentile, and they were part Jews. The Gentiles didn't like them because they were traitors, that they had married into the Jewish family or been part of a Jewish family. And the Jews said, well, you're unpure, you're not part of us. We can't have anything to do with you because you're unclean. And so people that were Jewish had absolutely nothing to do with Samaritans. But right in this passage of Scripture, the reason that Jesus had to go through through Samaria was a spiritual reason. The Holy Spirit had instructed Jesus, I have work for you to do in Samaria. And so this to follow up on this passage of Scripture, we're not going to stay a lot in John chapter 4 today, but just to give you some understanding. Jesus comes up and he sees this woman at a well, it's midday. And she's there at this well and she's drawing water. And we see a couple problems with that. Jesus has now sent his disciples off to Chick-fil-A to get some food, you understand what I'm saying? And he said, hey, you guys go get some food. I'm going to the well. And he's sitting by the well. And it's midday. It's the hottest part of the day. And there's this woman who's sitting at the well. And Jesus comes over and he sits beside her. And he said, "Uh, excuse me, lady, would you give me a little bit of that water to drink? Not a big deal. He's thirsty. It's hot. It's the middle of the day. It's actually a huge deal. He's breaking all kinds of cultural customs. First of all, men didn't talk to women. Jews didn't talk to Samaritans. And this woman was not an everyday regular woman, not an everyday regular Samaritan. As a matter of fact, she was at the woman at the well at noonday because she was an outcast. All the other women would go early in the morning while it was cool. And they would begin to draw their water. But you see, this woman had a reputation. It was not a good reputation. As a matter of fact, as you read on the scripture, you'll find out she had been married five times. She was living with a man now. So as a matter of fact, she didn't go to the well because she was the talk of the well, if you understand what I'm saying. All the other women would come and gossip about her. And Jesus comes to her and he says, Lady, he goes, if you knew who I was, I'd give you a water to drink where you would never thirst again. And she basically looks at him and says, Well, who do you think you are? Are you greater than our father Jacob? And through conversation and love, she begins to recognize she's talking to the Messiah. Jesus said, hey, go back and tell your husband. She goes, hey, I don't have a husband. He said, I know. I know about the other five. He said, the guy you're living with right now is not your husband. He says, but go and sin no more. She found something at the well that day. She found a loving father who was willing to forgive her. And so his disciples get back, and they look, and they go, whoa, wait a second, what's Jesus doing? Doesn't he know that's a Samaritan woman? But they do better to say anything, so they just discussed among themselves. 
And so finally, one of them got brave enough. I'm sure it was Peter said, hey, your Chick-fil-A sandwich is getting a little bit cold over here. Uh, you got you some waffle fries. Here, here's your food, Jesus. And he said, I've eaten food that you know nothing about. And then he goes to this verse that we just read right here, talking about the harvest. Do you not say four more months than the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. In one version it says, they are white unto harvest. In this passage it says, they are ripe unto harvest. So to understand the harvest, we have to, we have to talk a little bit about that. How many farmers do we have in here this morning? Raise your hand. Not a lot of farmers in here. We got one over here. Greg, Greg thinks he's a farmer, okay? Uh, farmer in the Dale over here. Um, Greg actually grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm. Um, but to understand this passage of Scripture, uh, we, we have to understand a little bit about farming. Some of you guys grew up on farms. My dad grew up on a tobacco farm. That's where I grew up at. Thank God when I came through, we didn't raise tobacco. Uh, that's a lot of hard work. But to have an understanding of this passage of Scripture, you really have to be able to understand farms. Jesus used a lot of farming illustrations throughout Scripture. And you see, these disciples, they would understand a little bit about the harvest. Now, I want to tell you something right now. He said, first of all, I want you to understand something. He goes, the harvest is now. And I want you to understand this one. We're going to be talking about that. The harvest for the church is right now. But there's something else you have to understand about the harvest. The harvest is hard. I, I want to tell you something. Harvesting is hard. You know, we, like I said, we grew up on a farm when I was a kid. We had some uh, pigs, and we had some chickens, and we had different things like that. At one time when I, when I was living here in uh, Roanoke, I, I had about 30 head of cattle. We'd have to cut hay and do all that fun stuff all the time, and I, I enjoy working around on the farm. But to have an understanding of the kind of farming they're talking about is a little bit different kind of farming. It's more of a crop farming. Um, I had never been around really big crop farms until uh, I met my wife. And, and I remember Stacy took me down to uh, Camden, North Carolina, where, where my buddy Jonathan, that's where we met at in Camden, North Carolina. And uh, she took me down to her grandparents' farm, which her uncle runs now, and her cousins. And uh, we went down to this farm, and uh, the first thing she told me to do, she said, we're going to climb up this thing right here. It's called the leg. I'm like, what in the world's a leg? She said, it's on top of the green beans, and you can see out across the farm. It's beautiful. Well, I walk over there, and I look up, and uh, I look up into eternity, and I see a ladder. And I feel like it was Jacob's ladder. I was going to keep on climbing until I saw Jesus, if you understand what I'm saying. And she said, it's not very high. She goes, just follow me. You know, of course, we're, at this time, we're, we're, we're just dating. We hadn't even gotten engaged. And, you know, being a man, I can't show her that I'm scared of heights. And so she gets on this ladder like a little monkey, and she starts climbing up. She's not in here this morning, is she? Thank God she's working next door. I won't get in trouble. And... Uh, so I, I start following her up this ladder, and I, I get not quite halfway, and I'm looking down. It's a long ways down. This ladder's a hundred and something feet high. That's what I said. And it's summertime. It's July. And you know, for some reason, when, you, when you, you're a little nervous or scared, you start to sweat more. And it being July, I, at this point, I wasn't sweating. I just gotten out of the shower. And, and that ladder feels kind of slick, and she goes up a little bit higher, and uh, she said, hold on, stop right there. I said, why? She said, uh, you've got to flip down the grate. I said, the grate? I said, what are you talking about? She said, that, that, that right there. She goes, unlock that and flip down the grate. She goes, that way if you fall, you only fall halfway. <laughs> at this point, I look up at her. I said, honey, this is not a grate. This is called a cheese grater. Because if I fall from that distance, I'm going to be shredded into pieces, falling down to the very bottom. Reluctantly, I flipped the gate. And I followed her to the top with my eyes closed and told her how beautiful it was up there. And uh, we got to the top. I'm not kidding. It was just swaying. But you could see for miles and miles, nothing but fields. Corn fields. Soybean fields, depending upon the year. Other times, it's wheat fields. Back in the lake, John could tell you, he grew up there. And uh, we spent a lot of his time there back in the lake. And it's about 20,000 acres between the farmers back in there. And it's absolutely flat. Far as you can see at different times, it'd be either corn or soybean or wheat or barley, depending upon the season. And uh, when I first went down there, I'd never seen farming quite, quite like this, combines on tracks and big tractors on tracks. It's this totally different type of farming 
you know, here in the mountains, you have mountains and you have cows and you run them up and down a hill and you try to plant wherever you can. And, uh, you know, John used to always be amazed when he would come down here at the rocks. He's like, oh, we just don't have rocks back in North Carolina. I'm like, wait until you come to Virginia and try to drill a hole, uh, to dig a hole. You'll, you'll hate every rock you see for the rest of your life. And that's just a totally different, totally different life there. But one thing that I learned about the wheat, the wheat grows up and it gets golden. It gets real pretty. But then what happens to the wheat is it turns white. When that wheat hit is white, that means it's ready to be picked. It's time for harvest. And it means if you don't harvest this wheat right now, you're going to lose your crop. Now, one thing that you'll learn about the farmers, I, I thought, you know, okay, you just went in there and they plowed the fields, they planted some corn and planted some wheat, and then they just waited for months, you know, for the time of harvest. But can I tell you, they work nonstop, 12, 15-hour days. They work. And they work, getting rid of weeds out of the corn. They work on equipment constantly, spraying, fertilizing. They're always working the field, constantly. And to help me out a little bit, I said, well, the harvest isn't that bad, is it? And I remember one time her cousin Nicholas said, well, you know, the corn doesn't pick itself. And so that makes pretty good sense. <laughs> And hours and hours, day after day, picking hundreds of acres a day. There's one guy on a combine. There's another guy with a tractor with a, with a cart behind it. And the whole time he's picking, filling up that combine. The other guy's coming right beside him, and he's filling up this green cart. There's another guy in a tractor and trailer. He goes over there, and they dump from the cart into the tractor and trailer. And that tractor and trailer leaves the field, and they bring it, they drop it in the dryer, and it goes into these green bins that's connected to that leg that goes to heaven that, that the next time I want to be there is when Jesus is with me. <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden, they, he parks this 18-wheeler, and all the corn's dropped in. It goes to the dryer that's sent there, and you know what he does? He gets in another 18-wheeler, and he goes straight back to the field. All day long is the harvest. You see, harvesting is hard work. Farming it's hard work. And so when Jesus sits there and he looks at these disciples and he goes, the fields are white in the harvest, they understand something, that if it starts to rain and we don't have the crop out of the fields, we will lose the harvest. Do you understand what I'm saying, church? We have a culture right now that is white unto harvest. They're seeking, they're searching, they want to know truth, they want to know that somebody loves them. Can I tell you, the fields are white and the harvest, and guess what? The corn doesn't pick itself. You see, we have a responsibility as a church to the harvest. Jesus said, I had to go through some men. Today, we're going to be talking about the harvest, and we're going to be talking about God's laws of planting and God's laws of harvesting the seed that we're supposed to plant. There's some things about seed that we should understand. And, then, and when we really begin to talk about the harvest, it really starts back in Genesis. In the Old Testament, Genesis 8.22, it says this. As long as the earth endures, listen to this, there's seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. In Galatians 6.7, it says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Listen to this. A man reaps, listen to this, what he sows. A man reaps what he sows. So when we look at sowing, I want you to understand something about sowing seed. When we start looking at different techniques of farming, the farming he's talking about here is called broadcasting. Uh, one of the things that I like to do every year is I, I plant fields every year. My dad, he usually helps me, and uh, this year I had Sawyer out there helping me. Uh, we, we plowed up in uh, this one particular field, and we'll take the rotary tiller, and we run through it. It's a couple acres. And we'll go through there, and then we come back and we broadcast seed. And so basically what you have is this thing that goes over your side, and there's a big bag, and we have a seed drill, but I can't use it because it's different types of seed, this particular seed that I sow. And so you have this big bag that you wear on your side, and you have to go through, and you take this handle and you spin it. The whole time you're spinning it, it's sitting there spitting seed out. And it, it's just throwing seed to the side, different kinds of seed, and it has to hit the ground uh, at a certain rate. And then it has to be come back, and you have to, after you've already cultivated the land and broke it up, you have to cover it up. 
You see, can I tell you something about sowing seed? We sow seed every single day in our life. You see, each and every one of you are sowing seed right now, and you don't even realize it. You're sowing seed in relationships. You're sowing seed right now in your health. You're sowing seed in your finances, in your career. And can I tell you something? If you're sowing seed in areas in your life, and you say, you know what, Pastor, I'm just struggling in this area of my life. Say, for example, that you struggle with appreciation. Pastor, I don't feel very appreciated. My husband don't seem to appreciate me. My wife don't seem to appreciate me. My boss don't seem to appreciate me. I don't seem like anybody appreciates what I do. You you ever been there in life, you kind of feel that way? Don't look at your wife right now. Don't look at your husband. Sometimes we don't feel what appreciated. Can I tell you something this morning? If you want to be appreciated more, sow more seeds of appreciation. When you start appreciating others more, all of a sudden you start to see the harvest. You see, the more that you sow, the more you receive. If you need more forgiveness, sow more forgiveness. Whatever it is that you have in your life, whatever need it may be. This morning, if you have your bulletins, I want you to get your bulletins and open it out. We're going to be in a two-part series for the next couple weeks. And we're going to be looking at God's law of planting and harvesting. God's law of planting and harvesting. And there's several scriptures I'm going to get you, and you can just write them down as we go through them today. But number one in your outline says this, everything starts with the seed. Now, I want you to think about this, ideas, thoughts, dreams, everything always starts the seed. Can you imagine when Walt Disney was sitting down that day, after all the rejections that he had, people had told him that he had no imagination, that there's no way that he could ever do anything at the magnitude that he was thinking. Here's one of the guys I believe probably had one of the greatest imaginations in the world. Somebody said, you have no imagination. But everything that Walt Disney did, everything that we enjoy today, you know it has started with an idea, with a thought that Mr. Disney had. It it started with one thought. It started with a seed. You see, we give seed away to help others. It was said this way one time, you can count the seeds in an apple, but you cannot count the apples in a seed. You can take an apple and you can split it open. You can count all the seeds that's in that one apple. But if you took just one of those seeds out and planted it, and it produces an apple tree, you would never be able to count all the seeds of apples that that one seed could produce. You see, the same thing's true in our life. A lot of times what we do is we take the apple and we eat it, and we throw away the core. You know what we're doing? We're throwing out the seed. You see, we want to have appreciation. We want to receive forgiveness. We want love. But are we ever sowing it back in somebody else's life? Everything starts with the seed. Seeds of advice. Love, finances, seeds of word, seeds of trust, seeds of kindness that build other people up. You are constantly sowing seed in your life. It's kind of like the parent who sits there on the side of the pool and they look at their little kid and their, their kid's scared of the water and they sit there with their arms open wide and they just tell them to what? Jump. They're sowing seeds of what? Trust. Trust me, I'll catch you. Trust me, I'll catch you. We're constantly sowing seeds in everything we do in our life. Number two in your outline says this. Nothing happens until seed is planted. And John 12, 24 says this. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. This passage of scripture right here is talking about Jesus. Jesus was that seed of eternal life that came for us. He said, I must die that I may produce life in you. And we begin to understand something. This was the mission that Jesus came, that he could produce everlasting life. He said, that's why I came. He said, but seed must die and seed must be planted. Nothing will happen until the seed is what? planet. 
You know, a few years ago, I got this really big bag of seed, and I was excited about it. I bought it back during the spring, and I couldn't wait for the fall to plant it. Now, a lot of you guys ask what I plant, okay? Uh, I've had some people say, Pastor, you're just talking about planting seed, and people talk to me about planting seed sometimes. Says, what kind of crop do you plant? Um, the seed I plant is for meat. You're going, what in the world are you talking about? We plant hay for cows, and we plant food plots for deer. Some of you guys are starting to catch on now. And uh, I had gotten this one bag of seed that I wanted to plant, and I couldn't wait to plant this seed. It was, for a, it was for a winter harvest plot that I was planting. It grows brassicas and turnips and all this stuff, and when the, when the frost comes, it hits it, and what happens to, to the, the stalky leaf, all the sugars come to the top, and guess what? Deer love to eat it, and I like jerky. So it works out for both of us. They get fat, and we eat them, and we reproduce. It's the circle of life. It keeps on going. And so all of a sudden, I was excited about this, about this seed that I was going to plant. But there was only one problem. The seed never grew. You know why the seed never grew? Because the fall came around, and I started plowing, and I started planting, and I started getting everything ready. And I had forgotten where I had put this bag of seed. And so I went to the store and bought some other seed. And in my time looking around, I found the bag of seed that I really wanted. But you, can, I, can I tell you what I learned that day? I don't care how long I had that seed, how much I loved that seed, how excited I was for that seed to grow. Until I planted that seed, as long as it was in the bag, it was never going to grow. You can be as excited as you want to about Jesus. We can do as many campaigns as we feel God's called us to do. We can get excited about buildings and how they look. But if we don't sow pe seed into people's lives, we've done nothing. You see, church, this whole compassion campaign that we've been in, and talking about going into deep waters, is all about one thing, and that's the harvest. It's about sowing seed into people's lives. And in order for us to sow seed and to get the seed ready to be planted, can I tell you what? We have to, we have to break up that ground, and we have to prepare that ground, and it's not always easy. There's all kinds of different kind of soils. And we have to prepare. We have to be ready. You see, we can pray and pray for God for the harvest, but if we're not ready for the harvest, guess what? We're going to be in trouble. We have to be ready. You see, that seed never sprouted because I never took it out of the bag. You see, seeds are meant to be planted. So in seeds, also an act of faith. You see, something happens that's great when we give seed away. When we sow seed, it's, it's a risk. Sowing seed's risky. I, I, I was sitting down one time and I was talking to Stacy's uncle, and he runs everything on the farm now. And he was telling me about how many acres that they typically yield, how many, how many bushels of corn they would yield per acre. And they, it, mathematically, everything's broken down. They have, they have computers on their combine that tells you when they're picking the corn how much moisture is in the corn. They can tell you how long it's going to take to dry that corn out. They can sit there at the GPS and program in that combine, and it's going to actually go row to row exactly how they have planted that corn. It's a lot of thought and a lot of effort that goes into it. But he said, you know what? He goes, we can have all this technology, and we can plant all this corn, but if God doesn't provide the rain, it doesn't matter. You see, he said, we have to do our part, but we have to trust God's going to do his part. Can I tell you that God's always faithful? When it comes to the harvest, spiritually, I never have to worry about God doing his part. The problem always usually arises on my side. When there's times we say, God, I just, I'm tired. God, do I really have to go sit down and talk to that person? God, do you want me to go back in that store and tell them about this? Let's be honest. How many times in our life we just were tired? We say, I just don't really feel like even talking to them today. God, I don't feel like being kind to them. You know how rude they've been to me? Let's be honest. You see, but if we don't plant seeds, there'll never be a harvest. God will always be faithful when I do what I'm supposed to do. 
You see, planting that seed is always risky because we don't know what's going to happen. We can't go and we can't look beneath the dirt. All I can do is by faith plant seed and say, God, I trust you. God, you gave me the seed in the first place. God, my job is to plant it. In Mark 4, 26 and 27, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like someone who plants seed in the ground. Night and day, whether the person is asleep or awake, the seed still grows. But the person does not know how it grows. God, I don't understand how all it works. But God, I know you're in charge. God, my job is simply to sow seed. God, your job is to change lives. So you know what? It doesn't matter. I can invest in anybody who I want to invest in, but it's up to God to change their lives. Do you understand that, church? We can't get discouraged. We can't get upset when you go, Pastor, I've been praying for this guy for 20 years. I'm just going to give up. Don't ever give up. That's up to God to change lives. In our, in our connect group this morning, uh, David Argerbright was teaching this morning. He was talking about George Mueller. For 60 years, George Mueller play, prayed for one particular friend. And it was just after George Mueller died that his friend got saved. You say, Pastor, that doesn't seem very fair. He never got to see him saved. Can I tell you something? I'm going to tell you this. In heaven, he's going to see that man. You see, I want to tell you something. Sometimes sowing seed is hard. Sowing seed is not always easy. But can I tell you, there's eternal rewards in your investment. We can invest in anything else we want to in this world. I don't care how big your 401k is. I don't care what your net worth is. You can sit here and you can invest into anything in this world that you want to invest in. And guess what? When you die, it's still here. And you're still dead. You can't take it with you. I don't care if, it, I don't care if the Brinks trucks follows you to your grave and they plant it in the ground. Guess what? That money's still in the ground. And your soul's still going to come before an eternal God. The only investment I can ever make in is in spiritual things that has an eternal reward. The greatest legacy, I talked about it last week, that I can ever leave my kids is Jesus. It's not finances. That's the greatest thing I can ever leave them, is a legacy of faith. It's to sow seeds of faith in my children's life. But if I don't plan it, guess what? Nothing will ever happen. The third thing is this. When there is a need, sow more seed. If there are barren fields in your life, start planting. Now, I'm going to tell you this. The same thing is true in the church. When there are barren fields in the church, start planting. You know, I heard somebody say something to me one time. They said, Pastor, we just need this ministry in the church. And they went on and on about the need of the ministry in the church. And finally, I looked at them and said, I agree with you. Stop praying about it. Start doing something. Can I get an amen? If God has laid it upon your heart so much that you... There's a need that's in the church. I'm going to tell you what, if there's a ministry anybody ever wants to do, you're not going to ever hear me say, let's not do the ministry. But you will hear me say, if God's laid down your heart, you run it. Because I can't get upset if somebody's sowing seed in a different field than I'm in. Because I have to be in the field that God's called me in. I recognize something. In my area of life right now, I have young kids. One of the greatest harvest fields I have happens during the fall on a football field. I love being with kids. I love young kids. You know what? It's a time that I can invest in their life. And, and I, I want to teach them about character and that life's more important than football. Then we come to the, the, the winter time. And you know what I do? I'll be doing this winter. I'll be in here a few nights a week, and I'll have a little basketball team, and we're going to play basketball. And one of the things that I'll talk to our kids about every practice is about character, the, the importance of, of having faith and trust, and we'll share Jesus with them all year long. You know what? To be honest with you, I'd much rather be in my tree stand. Let's be real this morning. There'll be nights when I'll say, you know, man, I'd, I'd much rather be out there hunting right now. Or I, I, I'd much rather be with my wife going to dinner right now. But I realize that God has placed me in a harvest field at this place and point in time in my life. God's given each and every one of you a harvest field at this particular time in your life. I also realize this. My youngest son, uh, last Saturday, played his last Little League football game before he starts middle school. You see, it's a different change in a season of life. That was hard. Watching in the third quarter, 
two seconds on the clock. He took a snap, and he came back, and his wrist was like this. We walked over there and looked at it, and you could see it was twisted. And I looked at my wife and said, go ahead and take him to the hospital. And he came up to the sidelines, and Mitch Coach was there, and he looks at it, and he grabs his wrist, and he pulls it forward, and he's taking his wristband off, and he snaps it right back in place. We left from there. He stayed at the game he wanted to stay. It was his last game. We left from there. We went to urgent care. We prayed on the way over there that it wouldn't be broke. We got there, waited for two hours. The emergency rooms are fast. You'll catch on to that a little bit later. <laughs> we got there. They took the x-rays, and they said everything's in place. There's nothing broke. That is a praise. We prayed on the way over there. I'm just going to tell you, I believe in prayer. We went through this with my son, sorry, a few months ago, and a doctor showed us the break in his leg twice. I believe God heals. But we were so in seeds of prayer, and his life was important of it. But I recognized something that Saturday on the way to that hospital. That was the last time I would coach him at that age. I don't begrudge the field that God has placed me in. It's not always easy. You see, but I realized something a long time ago. My time is not my time. It belongs to God. And wherever God has you at right now, you should be plowing. You should be sowing. You should be preparing for a harvest. We should always be ready. You see, where there's no sowing, there's no harvest. There's some things we don't have to pray about. We just have to start working. We have to work in the fields where we're at. Ecclesiastes 11.6 says, Plant early in the morning and work until evening, because you don't know if this or that will succeed. They might both do well. We don't know. We just have to be obedient. You see, God's given people free will. We don't know what people are going to do. We know we can be faithful. We know God will always be faithful. So our job is to simply plant, and our job is to simply sow. Number four is, whatever I plant, I will reap. Now, here's a valuable lesson that some of you guys, I, I want to teach this to you this morning. This is very important. It's probably the most theological, greatest thing you'll ever hear me say. If you plant corn, you won't get watermelon. I want you to catch this. I know some of you guys are laughing, but if you plant corn, you will never, ever get watermelons. You say, well, Pastor, what in the world are you talking about? Listen to what Galatians 6, 7 says. Don't be fooled. You cannot cheat God. People harvest only what they plant. So my question is to you today, what are you sowing into your life? What are you sowing into your family? You will reap what you sow. If you sow love, you're going to get love. If you sow faith, you're going to reap faith. Whatever you're sowing in your family, in your health, in your finances, in your relationship, that's what you're going to get. I, I remember I went to a guy's house one time, and, and, and I was sitting there, and I was talking with him. He asked me if I'd come by and pray with him. I said, sure, and I, I came by to see him. He was struggling with COPD, and he had cancer of the lung. And I went by there to see him, and, and there's a guy I've known him for a long time, and he said, Pastor, he goes, I just really need you to pray for me. I said, sure, I'd be glad to pray for him. We talked about his relationship with Jesus and some different things. And uh, he goes, well, I need you to specifically pray that God would heal me. I don't mind praying for God to heal people. I believe God heals people. The only problem was this man was sitting there with COPD. He was sitting there with lung cancer, and he was smoking a cigarette with oxygen. I looked at him, I said, God can't help stupid. I had a good enough relationship with him to say that. I wasn't being mean. He looked at me, what do you, he said, what do you mean, Pastor? I said, you're sitting here and you have lung cancer, lung disease, you got COPD. I said, I said, let me see your pack of cigarettes. And he handed them to me. I said, do you see this right here? It's called a Surgeon General's Warning on a Label, that this will cause cancer. I said, why are you expecting God to do a miracle in your life if you're not willing to change your life, your lifestyle? 
Now, I recognize I want to lose some weight, but I also recognize something. I've got to quit eating donuts in the back. What you sow, you're going to reap. What you sow, you're going to reap. If I sow seeds of weeds, guess what I'm going to get in my garden? I'm going to get weeds. Listen to what the scripture says about bad seed. Here's just a few of them. In Job 4, 8, it says, I have noticed that people who plow evil and plant trouble harvest it. Proverbs 22, 8. Those who plant injustice, listen to this, will inherit disaster. And the reign of terror will come to an end. Hosea 10, 13 says, But you have planted wickedness, and you have reaped evil. You have eaten the fruit of deception because you have depended on your own strength and on your many warriors. Matthew 7, 2 says, For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard in which you use in judging is the standard which you will be judged. Scripture is very clear. Whatever seed you're sowing is what you will reap in your life. If you sow negative seed, you're going to reap a negative harvest. But aren't you glad that God's good? If I just read that in Scripture right there, I'd leave here depressed today. I'm going to be honest with you. But I love what Scripture says about sowing good seed. This is what it says. In Proverbs 11:8, it says, The wicked earns deceptive wages, but the one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward, an eternal reward. Reward. You understand that, church? That when you sow good seed, seeds of righteousness, that you're going to receive God's reward. Listen to Hosea 10, 12. It says, I said, plant the goodness, the good seeds of righteousness, and you will receive a harvest, a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. He said, you know what? When there's hardness in your heart, when there's things in your life that aren't going the way that they should, he goes, hey, plow up the hard ground. He said, work the ground. It's not always going to be easy. One of the things that I learned when I moved to Roanoke was when, when, when I went to plow ground here, it was totally different. I grew up in Athematics County right on the Buckingham line, and all the ground we have is what they call red clay. It's hard soil. That is the nastiest stuff that you'll ever see in your life. If you get it on your clothes, guess what? It never comes out. It's just red, nasty clay. And it's so hard to grow stuff in that type of soil. It's hard to break it up. You would plow it, and you would have to disc it and disc it and disc it before you could even get the ground to become soft enough to even try to plant it. But when I moved to Roanoke, when I, when I came up here in some of the fields, uh, when we started to plow some of the fields, we, we noticed the soil was different. It's a much darker, richer soil. It broke up much easier. When, when I go to North Carolina, they have a totally different soil. Like they'll, they'll take and they'll come to that, these huge discs. And when they open up, they're actually just wider than this building right here. And, and they'll, they'll come through these huge discs and they'll just turn the soil and it's black and rich. It looks like potting soil. It's beautiful. And the soil is so much better. Can I tell you what? Every one of those soils will grow a seed. It just takes work. If we have hard hearts, we have to allow God to break through them. I don't know what your life's been like. Some of you guys, you come from a great legacy, and you've had your, your hearts and your life has been full of great soil your whole life. There's been great seeds that have been planted in you. But can I tell you what? It doesn't matter where you came from. It matters where you're going. God wants to change your life. In James 3.18, it says, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Do you understand you will reap what you sow in your children, in your spouse, in your job? If you sow anger, you're going to reap anger. If you sow patience, you're going to reap patience. If you sow laziness, you're going to reap laziness. If you sow peace, you're going to receive peace. You sow comfort. You're going to reap comfort. Love. 
you're going to reap love. If you sow appreciation, you're going to reap appreciation. You know what? If you want to change your, li- your, your life, appreciate your wife. Appreciate your husband. Appreciate your kids. Appreciate your coworkers. Appreciate the people around you. Whenever they do something great, tell them how much you love them and appreciate them. Because the truth of the matter is, we can't do anything alone in life. We need each other. In this church, we need each other. When we go through times in life, we are going to need each other. Listen to God's promise and his warning right here in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be misled. No one makes a fool of God. Would a person plant, he will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the need of others, ignoring God, Harvest the crop of weeds. All he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvest the crop of real life, eternal life. Number five in your outside line says this. There are many people who are sowing. Now, I want you to understand something. You're not the only person who's sowing in your life. You're not the only person sowing in your kid's life, in your family's life, in your co-worker's life. There's people sowing seed all the time. People are sowing good seed, and people are sowing bad seed. Some of you guys came from a family history of abuse, and that's what your family's been for a long time. It's been abusive. There's been seeds of abuse that have sowed and sowed, and they will continue to do so until somebody in your family decides to break those chains. You have the ability to sow different seed in your family's life. Some of you guys in here, you're reaping the benefits of a godly family. Somebody in your family years ago started a godly life, and they continue to sow godly seeds in your life. If you're not reaping the benefit of godly seed, you need to start planting godly seed in your life. In John 38, 4, it says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits, listen to this, of their labor. Do you realize that right now that we're reaping the benefits of somebody else's labor right now? I don't know about you, but about 30 minutes ago, and here it was pretty hot. Somebody got smart and turned the air conditioner on. Thank you, R.D. You know, we're reaping the benefit because, you know what, several years ago, There's a pastor that saw a vision of placing this building here. Years before that, there was another pastor that had the vision of building the brick sanctuary next door. Now it's a children's education building. Before that, there was a little white chapel on the hill that a man had a vision of. It started as an idea, one seed. There should be a church there. Do you realize that we're reaping the benefits right now? We're reaping the benefits right now of seed that somebody else planted. Seeds of generosity. Sometimes we'll never even see the benefits of seeds that we've sown. And this compassion campaign, one of the things that, that we're doing is, is really is geared to our children's area. But we believe that God's called us to go into a harvest field. There's been a barren field. There's some crop out there, but not nearly enough. We're supposed to sow seed. I believe in it. That's why, that's why I'm part of the compassion campaign. You know what? I don't have any kids in children's church anymore. Somebody else will benefit from seed that we're sowing. After we're gone, guess what? Somebody will continue to benefit from seed that you've sown. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that God took a seed and he planted an idea in the heart and the mind of S.J. Connor. Because of that seed, I sit here in the past 20 years of my life, and I've seen how God has worked in my life and the life of the church, and I'm blessed and I'm thankful because of it. You see, because when we're sowing seed, we don't know how, how it's going to return. We don't know how much that seed's going to produce other seeds. We're benefiting from previous generations right now. I'm thankful for those who planted. I'm thankful for those who have watered, who've poured and invested in me. That's why it's so important, I believe, that we have to teach our children the importance of investing right now in sowing seed. We, don't ever, we, we never know how one life is going to affect another life. 
There's a story that's told of a lady who used to teach Sunday school class. She got up one Sunday morning, she prepared a lesson, and she was all excited to go teach. And she got there to that little church. She opened up her Bible, and she opened up her lesson, and she sat down with her one student. And she taught that lesson just like there was thousands of students in her class. She taught it with all of her heart. Only one person showed up that day. One person came to Jesus that day. This lady was investing. She was watering. She came to harvest one seed. We know how many seeds are in one apple, but we don't know how many apples are in one seed. That young child that day was named Billy Graham. Because that lady saw the investment of investing in one child. She could have easily said that day, you know, God, I'm just going to save this lesson for later and we're going to do some coloring sheets. But she said, no, God, you've given me a harvest field. God, you've given me one seed. We never know whose life we're going to touch. It's going to touch many other lives. Number six, reaping is always a different season than sowing. Reaping is always a different season than sowing. You see, you have to sow long before you ever reap. I'm going to close with this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, it says this. There is a time for everything, a season for everything under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. There's a time to be born and a time to die. All of us in here, our days are numbered. I remember one time I had a discussion with a guy, and I was, I was young. I, was, I had just entered the ministry, and I was at Lynchburg Church of Nazarene. I was, I was about 20 years old, 19 or 20 at the time. And I had a guy come to me, and, and uh, we were actually at a hospital praying for, for a lady that I knew. And he looked at me, he goes, you know, Pastor, if you have enough faith, God will heal this lady. He said, I don't believe anybody's ever supposed to die. He said, he said if, you pray, if you pray with a lot of faith, I don't believe they're supposed to die. And I looked at him, I started laughing. You know, of course, I'm 19, 20 years old. I said, I said, what do you mean? He said, if people have enough faith in Scripture, they just won't die. I said, that's not true. I said, because that means if somebody had enough faith, they would never die. That, that goes against Scripture. And I said, not only that, I said, but if nobody ever dies, how are we ever going to populate heaven? You see, Scripture says there's a time to be born, a time to die. That the Scripture tells us that our, no, our days are numbered. And so we're to spend each and every day as an investment into God. You see, there's a time that we're going to be born, and there's work for us to do. There's also a time when God calls us home, and that's when we receive our eternal reward. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to uproot. You see, sometimes when we plant, we sit there, the fields look so barren. Then all of a sudden we see the we see the crops starting to come up, and it's so pretty. It's nothing like looking over a wheat field of gold and wheat field, and you watch as the wind blows, and it blows back and forth. It's so pretty. But there also comes a time that you have to uproot that wheat. It's time to be picked so it can be sown. There's a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. Now, I think that's hard in our lives sometimes because we sit here and we say, well, God, we've, we've built this while we're tear, tearing it down to change it. And that's really hard in a church sometimes. Sometimes we look at a church and we say, you know what? Well, I, I remember when brother so-and-so built this or sister so-and-so built this. It was back in 1972, and they, 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 they built this right here. And I don't think we need to change it because they built it. Can I tell you, there's a time to tear down and there's a time to build. So, Pastor, what do you mean? I remember I was talking with one lady one time, and she said, I don't think we need to remodel anything. I said, well, how come you changed the pictures in your house? Why did why'd you, why'd you get a new sofa? Well, that one was old and outdated. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Do we ever change the curtains on our walls? Do, do, do we ever change the pictures on our walls? Do we ever change our carpet, except for John Rippey because he's too tight? Candy, I'm glad you came into his life. <laughs> John said, give me that 1970s carpet back, <laughs> that harvest gold. 
How many of you guys remember harvest gold, for, uh, the, 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 the commode and the harvest gold? Yeah, you remember how ugly that was back then? Hey, man, if you still like it, I'm sorry. That's okay. We all have different tastes. Uh, you know, I remember I liked it so much when I was a kid. We took all my mom's fingernail polish and tried to paint it for her. She didn't like that neither. Um, that was one of the worst whippings I ever got in my life. <laughs> all of her Avon was gone. <laughs> but there's a time what? T- time to tear down and a time to build. You know what? Sometimes, you know, we just have to go through and we have to say, you know what? Things that worked in 1970, they don't work in, you know, 2019. I learned that when I was doing, when I was doing student ministries. Things change. Kids are not the same. When I was a kid, when I was doing student ministries, they're definitely not the same now when I was doing student ministries. Kids are constantly changing. Culture's changing. You know what? But the gospel never changes. We may use different vehicles, but the gospel never, ever changes. That's the one good thing. You know what? I'm not going to take kids roller skating like you would back in 1970, but I can remember the kids loved to go play paintball. They loved to shoot each other. They loved to do crazy things. Uh, you know, things change. Scripture goes on to read like this. It says, there's a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn. I can't say this too loud because we're in the church of Nazarene. There's a time to dance. Just keep one foot on the ground. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing Everything, listen to this church, has a season. Everything. Our seasons of life is always changing. You see, in your life right now, you may be in a different season. Some of you have children, may have just graduated high school and they're in college. Some of you have kids right now that have been in preschool and they're getting ready to go to elementary school. Some of you guys now are at a different point in your life that your grandkids are graduating high school. And you're in a different season of your life. Can I tell you what? It doesn't matter what season we're in. Listen to this. We're always planting. We're always expecting a harvest. And Timothy, it says, be ready in season and out of season. You know what? That at any time, We should be ready and prepared to harvest what God has for us. There's always a different season. Some things you harvest in the spring. Some things you harvest in the fall. There's different times of planting. Do you recognize that God has put a new harvest field right across our hillside? There's a whole group of townhomes that have been built right beside us. Just up the street. Right across from Hardy's right up here in Denton, the old William Byrd High School. There's another harvest field that's right there. But not just there. Where do you work at? There's a huge harvest field. You see, wherever you're at in life right now is where your harvest field's at. God's placed you where you're at. You know, I can't walk into advanced auto where Jeremy goes to work every day and walk in and just start telling people about Jesus. They'll say, there's some crazy bald-headed guy, call the cops and get him out of here. Because I don't have that badge that says AutoZone. I can't walk into William Byrd High School and start talking about Jesus. I don't have a badge that says I'm an employee of William Byrd High School. I'm not a student that's enrolled in William Byrd High School. I can't walk in there and just start telling people about Jesus. But can I tell you, students, something? God has placed you exactly where you're at for a reason. You're one of the greatest places in your life to be able to sow seed. Not to sow seed, but to reap a harvest. You know what some of you guys will pastor? Thank God I'm in my golden years. I've already retired. I I don't even go to work. Can I tell you what? There's plenty of work to be done. There's a group that comes in here every week. They set up for the food pantry. There's people that come into the food pantry every week. We don't know what lives are being touched, but we know they are. There's going to be clients that come through our food pantry are going to walk through these doors, and you'll never know who they are but their lives will be eternally changed. Why? 
because we're planting seed. This morning, as we get ready to close in prayer, I just want you to stand where you're at this morning. I'm going to have our praise team come forward, and we'll have them close us out in just a minute. We're going to close out with a worship song today. We just want to praise God. But as you stand up where you're at today, I want you to ask yourself this question. Where is my harvest field? And if you can't answer that question, come see me. If you can't answer that question, just begin to pray and say, God, open up my eyes and show me where is the harvest field. Let's pray together this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we recognize tonight in just a couple short hours there's going to be a harvest field in our parking lot. There's going to be boys and girls and moms and dads and they're going to come here tonight looking for just a piece of candy. They're going to come here tonight, Lord, wanting to get a hot dog. Lord, but can we give them something so much greater? Lord, may we give them Jesus. Lord, may we sow seeds of hope tonight. May we sow seeds of love, kindness, seeds of generosity. Father, may we share Jesus. Lord, for these are all characteristics of who you are. You're a righteous God, a loving God, a forgiving God. You're a God of hope. God, tonight, may we open up our bags of seed. And Lord, mixed in that seed, can we open up a lot of bags of candy? Father God, we, we recognize that... Um, Lord, through the giving of a piece of candy, we open up the eyes of a little child and we open up their hearts. Lord, and tonight, may we be Jesus to somebody. Lord, we recognize the harvest is right now. So, Lord, today, may we go out into your harvest field. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.